Hello, this video is designed to give you a practical way to engage in the process of world building. I will be drawing on Mary Laurie's chapter, Ontological Rules, which provides an approach for classifying and differentiating imaginary worlds. The term ontology means the philosophical study of the nature of being and existence. Ryan's model is designed to help study imaginary worlds, but we're going to be using it to guide the creation of a unique world of your own. You can use this video in many different ways. It can be useful for developing highly complex fictional worlds full of history, potential, and detail. But this approach can also be useful for creating more simple and accessible worlds. Not every world you build has to be Westeros, Middle Earth, or Pandora. You can be building a simple backdrop for a mobile game or a children's television show or even an advertisement. Your world might be quite abstract, and so not every element of the following is going to be 100% useful for you. This approach is a choose-your-own-adventure, and you can make your choices as serious or as silly as you like and repeat the process as often as you like. The important thing is that with each option that we're about to explore, you write down your choice and add a few little details to give you a bit of context that will help you come back and build a description later. The first point of reference that we're going to need is the idea of the actual or the primary world. The following sets of options are designed to guide you through a rough assembly of a world while keeping in mind a specific distance from the actual world. The first set of options is probably one of the most important and the most complex. Here you are determining what Ryan calls the alethic value. This you know, vaguely means the modalities of truth or the modes of verisimilitude. Deciding on the alethic value is how you situate your world in terms of possibility and probability. So we have three options. Option one means that you are going to situate your world in the primary world, i.e. non-fiction, the world we know. You can set your world in the past or the present, but not the future, because it has to follow the rules and situations that we know to be true. Option two provides the first step of ontological distance. If you choose this option, there are things in your world that could be true, but there are possibly realistic fictions, such as science fiction, that helps create distance between your world and the primary world. For example, humans might have discovered faster than light travel or create advanced artificial intelligence. Selecting option three means your world is not constrained by rationality. It is a place where magic and fantasy and mythology can exist and be experienced. As we'll talk about going through these options, remember you can always mix science fiction and fantasy. By choosing one, you're not necessarily excluding the other. When we say the fantastic, we don't always mean you know extreme levels of magic and dragons and science. Something can be just slightly supernaturally different about your world. Same goes for technology. So keep that in mind. So you might set your world in the 1820s, but witches and unicorns exist. Or set your world in 2080, where there are techno mages and cyber dragons. The next set of options is the inventory of individuals. Here's where you start to populate your world with the most important characters. If you choose the same, option one, this limits your world to actual historical individuals. But it is not necessarily the work of history. The musical Hamilton is a good example of this. Option two introduces fiction into a realistic story world. It is augmented building on the primary world in some way, but still relying on the actual primary world as part of the ontological background. Harry Potter is a good example of this because it is set in an actual world, but is populated with individuals who are also part of another hidden dimension to that world, the magical world. 
Option three helps you escape the primary world entirely. This could be something like science fiction or science fantasy, like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, or a fusion of the two, one of my favorite worlds, the, the Pokemon universe, where there are some correlations to the, the actual world, but they are not ontologically part of the primary world that we live in. We then move on to the kind of sub-realm or sub-rule of common individuals. This is where you decide on what the qualities of your background characters and, your, and the people who populate your world resemble. You might choose one, which is kind of historically verified individuals, people who exist in the actual world, but aren't necessarily famous, right? Or regarded part of significant moments of history beyond just direct participation, such as soldiers in a war, people at a festival, that kind of thing. Selecting option two means you are starting to create a fictionalized biography of the background individuals who are found in your history, but who are not historical figures in and of themselves. This might be where you are gender swapping or race swapping or changing the background of the actual world in really important and interesting ways. Option three is, is total historical fabulation. This is where you see people who are part of the, the fictional and historical world that are not um, part of ours. So the classic example here are um, the, the characters, the kind of background characters and the, the people in the, the works of uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes or other uh, kind of you know, the villains and the background pe the people in, in works like The Three Musketeers and, and so on. It, it's really important to have a sense of not only who your primary characters are going to be and how they differ or appear in your world, it's really useful to have a sense of who the background, what the kind of qualities of the background characters, the common individuals of your worlds are going to be. We then have two sets of options for our worlds, and these can be used to distinguish the physical elements and the biological elements of your world. These options help to separate and develop your world from kind of realistic story world. Here you're starting to move away from realism. So when you pick the same for natural species, so you might pick ducks. They, even though they're the same as the actual world, they don't have to be realistic. And you could say move into option two, where they're kind of augmented in a particular way. This is very common in um, the, uh, worlds built for children, where you see lots of anthropomorphized animals. Animals, although not always for children, right? Remember George Orwell's Animal Farm, particularly excellent example of world building. Another example, of course, is Peppa Pig, right? Where which is very much the primary world, simplified, but populated with, you know, human animals. These are options that help you describe your world. So if you're going to be working with an illustrator or a team, your worlds at this stage when you're choosing your options don't have to be overly detailed. They can be really simplistic and even quite abstract. Alternatively too, right, when it comes to the natural or physical laws, you might choose augmentation to be supernatural in some way. Some of your individual historical figures or your, or your common individuals can see the future or can see elves living amongst people or can talk to the undead. These might be found to be actually quite different if we move into, into the option three bracket. However, option three, where you are dealing with totally different types of species in your world and totally different types of natural or physical laws is actually really difficult to, ach to achieve. Not impossible, but, but difficult. And Ryan argues that this is because we tend to relate emotionally to species that we know. And we tend to perceive the species that are unfamiliar to us as being threatening and dangerous. Now, take here's a great example. In Avatar The Last Airbender, we see mashups of species like the uh, the turtle duck, one of my favorites, um, the deer dog, the badger mole, the platypus bear, the spider wasp. And these also exist, uh, the koala sheep, of course, classic. These also exist alongside actual world correlates like the salmon and the bear and the boar. 
So, you know, it's left unclear as to how these creatures came into being, right? They're augmented possibly by magic in some way. Lovely part of world building. However, we get to games like No Man's Sky, which are procedurally generated. And so we see strange melanges of creatures that don't have any real world correlate. There are elements that look familiar, but they appear quite alien. If you're choosing imaginary species with supernatural abilities, you are then also selecting two and three in your natural physical law. So if there is a, a supernatural uh, uh, a creature with a supernatural ability, that means they're breaking the natural laws. A good example would be a unicorn that can fly without wings would be two and three in both categories. So this helps you design. So you can say, okay, I want, I want a natural species. So I'm going to pick an uh, elephant but I want it to be augmented and broken by magic. So it's a talking elephant. A good example, of course, is the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Turtles, but augmented by science in that instance. So as I was saying before, completely different natural laws are actually really difficult to make work, but are not impossible. Many of H.P. Lovecraft's stories postulate realities outside of our own, where the natural laws are, are different, and if perceived by us, would drive us mad. And a good example of this is the movie Annihilation, starring Natalie Portman, which looks at the idea of what would happen if our world were breached by a phenomenon from a, from a different universe, where the natural laws are different, and what might happen to humans in such an encounter. So there you can see these two worlds, the, the, the primary, the actual coming into conflict with the new. The next set uh, of options then are your technologies. This helps you distinguish between realism, science fiction, and fantasy, but also aids in creating interesting combinations. For example, in Tolkien's Middle Earth, it's a world that contains dragons and fantasy races, but magic is not extremely common. And indeed, magic in Middle Earth is actually a specific type of technology, a magical technology. And, and this also exists, of course, in, in Star Wars, which has a mix of advanced science and supernatural powers that are explained in scientific ways. Story worlds like the Dark Tower and even Ghostbusters mix you know, spirituality with advanced technology, interesting ways that, that help drive the narrative forward. This is where you start to build your cosmology. A cosmology can include a, a realistic approach, right, where there is just one world, although it may not be our primary world, but your world is just existing within this the singular, uh, the singular dimension of a singular world, and, and that's it. Option two is frequently part of science fiction and, and some fantasy texts where there exists some kind of travel. Celestial objects, hyperspeed, wormholes permit travel between uh, a, a panoply of, of planets in your uh, universe, your cosmology. And then that brings us to the multiverse or parallel universes. And this is this has been a long-standing tradition in comics and science fiction where there exists multiple parallel worlds. And that's really useful for you know adaptations. And, and Marvel and DC have found this really quite convenient to say, well, there's a comic book multiverse and then there's the the, the, the cinematic multiverse. And that's really cool and, and gives us a lot of flexibility in telling really interesting stories. It is important to note that fantasy and magically augmented science fiction or technologically augmented fantasy can also feature in these three options alongside our own cosmological organization. For example, one of my favorite worlds is Terry Pratchett's Discworld, which is a flat planet that sits on the back of four celestial elephants that rest on the back of a spacefaring turtle named the Great Artuan. Another important ontological dimension is time. Option one is a recognizable and realistic timeline, the historical timeline of the actual world that we understand. Option two is a distinctive feature of science fiction, but there is no reason it can't be magical. For example, the role-playing game Shadowrun is a, a cyberpunk future in which magic returns to the world and with it 
arrives, you know, orcs and elves and, and fantasy races. So you end up getting orc cyborgs, magical hackers, and elven street samurai. Option three, of course, is the characteristic medieval fantasy and fairy tales, the kind of timeless timeline. This is most useful for telling uh, supernatural and fantasy stories. But remember, the rules of generic conventions are most interesting when they are altered uh, and reinvented. Once you have your temporal settings, you can then move into your specific geography. Option one locates your setting in an actual real world or primary world location or similar. Given your other options though, right, the details may change. For example, you might be setting your space um, and the geography of your world in India, but people travel by Zeppelin. Option two is expanding on the real world in important ways, either technologically or fantasy or other, other ways. And, and a good example of that is, again, Harry Potter, which reveals secret hidden locations in the actual geography of the, the, the world that we know hidden spaces in the primary world. Lord of the Rings is also another good example because it's said to occur in the mythical past of our world, a lost mythical age, a truly different geography can be fascinating. One of the classic examples of this is Edwin A. Abbott's story, Flatland, which actually occurs in two dimensions. Another good example is the aliens of Zizin Lu's novel trilogy, The Three Body Problem. These are aliens who actually live under the effects of a solar system which has three suns. So a, a space-time geography that creates a really different world um, and then that comes into conflict with the actual world. Ryan's model provides a final set of rules that are um, helpful to position your story world with regards to different logical laws. These are that logic is respected and, and continued, that logic is occasionally violated and systematically violated. This set of rules can be usefully thought of as the degree of contradiction in your story world. Does your world make sense? Is it logical? Does it bend the rules of logic sometimes? Or is your world entirely incomprehensible compared to the primary world? And Ryan actually gives the example of the classic Lewis Carroll poem, Jabberwocky. "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borough graves, and the mome wraths outgrabe." These ontological rules are merely a starting set of criteria to help you define and distinguish your worlds. And you can start to refine and reiterate them based on your uh, further ideas, feedback from others, and building in detail and distinctions as you go. And you can go through these rules and these sets repeatedly to, to help, um, help add those details. Don't hesitate to experiment and push the terms and, and boundaries. Um, combine, mash up, and remix the primary world and, and, and take inspiration from all sorts of fiction and, and other worlds out there to help you create an interesting and unique setting to situate your game experience, your comic, your story, whatever it is. Thanks for playing, and remember to create more worlds. 